A while back, I was browsing Steam, as I do, looking for something new and obscure to play. That's when I stumbled upon the game Blood Orange. It looked weird, it was free, and there was a terrifying orange-tinted dolphin on the front. Obviously, I was sold immediately and downloaded the game to try it out. Little did I know that the game would leave me sitting in my room, staring at the credits, wondering what the hell I had just played. Blood Orange is an indie game developed by Decent Treatment and published by Semicolon that was released on November 3rd, 2023. I played the game shortly after its publication, and because of that went in completely blind. I believe this is the best way to experience the game, and so I greatly suggest that anyone who seems even remotely interested in a short, cosmic horror game with talking dolphins, stop this video now and download the game for yourself. It's free, only takes about half an hour for one playthrough, maybe 45 minutes, and it is completely worth it. If you aren't quite sold, then stick around and I'll put up a spoiler warning before I get into the real nitty gritty of this game. Blood Orange seems to be built on some version of the RPG Maker engine, but I can't say for certain. The game certainly isn't an RPG, and in fact can be more accurately described as a walking simulator with light puzzle and horror elements. For the majority of the game, you are exploring a bizarre underwater world and taking pictures using your camera. You take photos using a timed button press, the better the press, the cleaner the photo. I personally enjoy trying to get all the photos taken perfectly, and it's something that can help make multiple playthroughs more enjoyable. And trust me, you'll want to play all the way through this game at least four times. Blood Orange has multiple endings, four to be precise, that are based on a few choices the player makes throughout the game. One of the endings is very spoiler heavy, and we'll discuss that in the story portion, but the other three can be achieved using one of the main things you'll be doing in this game, conversing with dolphins. There are multiple dolphins who you'll talk to throughout the story, and depending on how you speak to them, you'll get one of three endings. The ending you get is based on a scale not of good or bad, but on pity versus anger. By answering in a way that makes the dolphins find you pitiable every time, you'll unlock ending A, the best ending. By answering in a way that makes the dolphins angry every time, you unlock ending C, the worst ending, or one of the worst endings. Give a mixed bad of answers and you'll unlock ending B, that's the one I got the most often. It's not necessarily a groundbreaking system by any stretch of the imagination, but it gives the game good replay value, and for such a short game it gave me a good amount of mileage out of it. I won't be going through a full walkthrough on how to get these specific endings, but one is available on Steam if you get stuck. You'll also find a few items in the game. Scattered throughout are four cassette tapes that you'll want to collect. They aren't necessary for the completion of the game, but for story purposes you'll want to grab them. They're all uh, semi-hidden. As long as you're exploring every screen before moving on, you shouldn't really miss any of them. The only other items you'll find in the game besides the cassettes are keys, and this is where noise control comes into play. In the latter half of the game, you'll need to be conscious of how much noise you're making, and prying the keys free can create noise. It's a mechanic that I was personally very confused by at first, but it's not complicated at all. Just make sure that the bar never fills up all the way, and you'll be fine. Similarly, towards the end of the game, you can also hide in lockers. Uh, I'll be honest, I almost never use this feature, but it's there and it's functional, it just never really fit my playstyle at all. The last major gameplay element isn't something you do, but instead something you'll have to manage throughout the game, your oxygen. You're a human being in a scuba suit, you can't breathe underwater, and if your oxygen tank runs out, uh, you die. To refill your oxygen, you'll need to surface. There are various points in the story to surface, and it's almost always beneficial to do so. Not only does surfacing allow you to refill your oxygen, but it allows you to develop all the photos you've taken so far and save your game via the radio. The radio also delivers cryptic messages every time you save that are important to the story. It might sound like a really stressful element of the game, but I rarely had an issue with it. For the first half of the game, you can almost entirely forget about it. As long as you aren't purposefully killing yourself by walking in circles, you should easily be able to reach the net surface point before running out of oxygen. Where this mechanic really comes into play is in the latter half of the game. Whenever you take damage, your oxygen is depleted. This can be incredibly dangerous, as even if an encounter doesn't kill you outright, it often leaves you with too little oxygen to continue on, and you'll die. This makes encounters tense, as you balance fleeing, hiding, and just tanking through damage to get away. You have no way of fighting back, and the best option often depends on where you are and how much oxygen you have. The unforgiving nature of this part of the game can be frustrating at first, but once I got a better understanding of the gameplay, I found it added a good challenge. It was terrifying, which is also a plus for any kind of horror game. Okay, 
I am going to stop again and say that if any of this has looked or sounded interesting so far, stop here and play the game. I'm about to go through the whole game and analyze the story. So if you don't want any spoilers, jump to this timestamp on screen. Are you still here? All right, let's talk story. You play as Nora, a researcher stationed out in the Amazon looking for the elusive Razorbat Dolphin. Now, those of you interested in cetaceans may know that there is no such thing as a Razorbat Dolphin, and you are right. In the real world, the Razorbat Dolphin is technically encrypted, and was spotted and allegedly photographed by a man named Jeremy Wade. Wade took the photos in 93 and 94, and at first believed it to be a new species of river dolphin. This is important, because currently only one species of freshwater river dolphin exists, the Amazon River Dolphin. And after some search and study, Wade now believes what he saw was a deformed or possibly mutilated Amazon River Dolphin. However, in the game itself, the Razorback Dolphin is the object of Nora's obsession, and she desperately wants to take a photo of one to prove its existence and justify her theories. At this point, we don't know how long she's been searching. But based on the dialogue, it's been long enough that she's all but lost hope in the existence of the elusive cetacean. However, she won't let herself stop, not after everything she's gone through, and is willing to search until she is forgotten. While on the boat, we can check the photos in our gallery, one being a blurry shot of the dolphin we're searching for, and another being a selfie, giving us a good look at our character. We can also check to see if there's anyone on the radio, and when we do, we hear a voice. <laughs> This saves our meager progress and we can now continue with the rest of the game. Donning a diving suit, Nora descends into the dark waters of the Amazon River and lands on what appears to be an ancient lost temple. Exploring the outside only yields a catfish and bizarre mysterious alien plants, but no dolphins. So Nora enters the temple. Inside there are several murals depicting different animals and mythical beings, but more importantly than those, there are dolphins. They seem to be just outside of our reach, but by following them through the temple, we eventually come across one at the end of a long hallway. Very surprisingly, it speaks to us, with the game telling us its name, Detestar. I'm hoping I'm pronouncing that right. Nora seems less surprised by this than we are, and actually less excited at getting a shot of a dolphin that she was looking for. She converses with him, and he reveals the dolphins have all been expecting her. He's otherwise extremely cryptic, dodging every other question Nora tries to ask him, and as quickly as he appears before us, he swims away. Nora continues down the hallway, snapping a picture by accident, and ascends further into the temple. At this point, we are given our first puzzle, as well as our first surfacing point within the temple. The puzzle is pretty easy. Step on the tiles on the floor in the same order as the little fish that swims around the room. What we really want to do here is surface. When we do, it gives Nora the opportunity to use her radio and develop her photos. We see the first few normal photos that we took, and then the one accidental shot at the staircase, eerily showing a woman sitting in the darkness. Uh, after this haunting scene, uh, we can check the radio again, and the following scene plays out. Once we move past the pillars, we're met with a few other simple button puzzles and a few ominous lines from Nora. After completing the puzzles, we chase after a fish that leads us into an impossible hallway that traps us in an ever-shrinking darkness. There we meet two new dolphins. One of them, Pesar, approaches us in an eerily human upright way. He gives us a few clues about our role in all this and seems to imply there are other dolphins out there who aren't necessarily looking to have a conversation with us. After our talk, we can return to the surface again and develop our new photo, 
And once again, we can talk on the radio, where we get this message. Returning to the water and climbing down a staircase, we arrive at a bridge across an abyss of nearly complete blackness. The occasional fish swims by, and bizarre lights flicker in the darkness. Then, we come across a red glowing doorway. We step inside and suddenly... We've been transported back to a memory. We find Desiree, our partner and the person we've been speaking to on the radio, sitting at a table waiting for us. She reveals that we never told them about the expedition that we have planned, and that she had to hear about it from a co-worker. After a heartfelt conversation, we promise to return after the expedition. The screen fades to black, and Regatar, another dolphin, appears. He quizzes us on the meaning of being a good person, and we descend deeper into the waters. He warns us that we should have never made it this far, and not to get killed. We are no longer in an ancient temple. Now we look to be in the remains of a bar, of a restaurant of some kind, completely flooded. A radio is waiting for us. We now know that it's most likely that all of these radio messages are from Desiree, and it becomes apparent later on that this message in particular is definitely from her. Outside of the room, you'll find a new nightmare. The murals have begun to depict you and another figure, likely Desiree, and bizarre eyes sit on the walls watching you, which you seem to mistake for mysterious plants. The place seems to be a bizarre fusion of the temple and the bar. Going down the stairs is much the same, and a dolphin can be seen eating or tearing through something on the ground. Alerting the dolphin to your presence causes it to go berserk and attack. The only options are to run or hide. Neither gets us very far, though. Instead, it's better to not alert the dolphin at all. We can do this by moving slowly and grabbing the key without making too much noise. Once you retrieve the key and don't get killed by the dolphin, you can travel deeper, finding a jukebox. Here you can use it like a radio, and this scene plays out.
After hearing the crash, we attempt to leave, only to be stopped by another dolphin. This one's name is Tamir. After giving us another cryptic message, he sends us on our way, and we must collect more keys and avoid being killed in the process by the other dolphin. Upon collecting the keys, we're ready to go to the final location, but before that we can do one last thing. Stopping back at the jukebox, we can insert the cassettes collected so far to learn a bit more about the story. Once you finish there, it's time to end this. We can return to a locked red door from before and enter, finding Desiree sitting in a chair. She's dead, and beckons for you to join her in death. This is where I will stop and show you all four different endings. If you haven't left already, and still care about having some part of the game not spoiled, leave now. If not, let's get into the endings. The first three endings are achieved by choosing to leave when she asks you to stay. Ending A is the best ending. is not something to wish for anyone. And if not for yourself, do it for me who loved you. Ending B is extremely similar, accomplished by being balanced for most of the run. The only main difference is in the final moments of the ending, shown here. Remind yourself of your humanity. Because people 
deserve to know and to hide it, for this monk has only sent to eat you from the inside. is not something to wish for anyone, and if not for yourself, do it for me who loved you. Goodbye, my love, and don't forget about me. Ending C is very different, being much more negative and is achieved by angering everyone. To relieve yourself of my burden, return satisfied with what you now remember. Forget about me and what you've done. Bury the past and live in blissful ignorance. The final ending is achieved by choosing to stay. It is the most different of all of them, and plays out like this. Blood Orange is one of those strange games that, despite not actually having a wealth of content, keeps you coming back again and again to see what details you might have missed on the first run through. I played through the game myself several times, 
both for this video and to just satiate my own curiosity. So, that begs the question, what is the full story behind the scenes? I'll try to lay it out for you as best I can, and we can get deeper into what the story actually means afterwards. Nora is a researcher who signs up for an expedition with Dr. C, a character who is never seen by the players, but who Nora communicated with over the radio, recorded on the cassette tapes that we find throughout the game. She signs up for this expedition without consulting her girlfriend at the time, Desiree. Her relationship with Desiree seems tenuous, with the stress of the work and her obsession to prove her theories correct making Nora withdrawn and distant. After Desiree confronts her at a bar, Nora promises to keep in touch and then leaves for the expedition. It is unclear if the rest of the messages that we receive throughout the game from Desiree over the radio are actual, real memories of the messages the two shared, or if they are a result of Nora's fractured mind. I personally believe that they are real messages, especially because some of the dialogue that we see in those messages matches up with what we see at the end of the game, but it's never fully or clearly stated. It appears that once the team arrived at the expedition site, Nora left to pursue her own research, ignoring the rest of the expedition. Dr. C reveals through dialogue that this must be a very difficult time for Nora, and that he's alright with her searching for the dolphins, alluding to the fact that Desiree had passed. It appears that either sometime before Nora left on the expedition or shortly after, Desiree was in a car accident and died. I'm personally under the impression that it occurred after, from the fight that Nora and Desiree have over the radio, and this is one of the main reasons why I believe that the messages did happen. However, once again, this could just be a manifestation of Nora's grief. Dr. C seems to want her to come back, but is also understanding of her passion and clear obsession with completing research, something that they share. While Nora is searching for her razorback dolphins, Dr. C is excited to reveal that he has found an Australopithecus specimen in the Amazon. For those of you who don't know, that is a highly suspect claim, as Australopithecus has only ever been discovered in Africa. At some point during the expedition, Dr. C falls ill. Some of the team believe he has been cursed for his discovery, while others believe it is simply dindu fever. Another scientist takes over communication and reveals some surprising news. The expedition is under fire, facing four counts of academic falsification and fraudulence over the supposed Australopithecus stroll. They demand Nora returns, and they are no longer asking nicely. Afterwards, one final message from Dr. C shows that the rest of the expedition team have left, and there is now just himself and Nora chasing their obsessions in the Amazon. An indeterminate amount of time later, Nora descends into the waters of the Amazon and into a world beyond human understanding. Seemingly some sort of nightmarish realm a la Silent Hill, the dark waters of the Amazon pull her through a manifestation of her obsessive search not only for the Razorback Dolphins, but for forgiveness and freedom from the guilt that has haunted her the entire trip. Depending on the ending you receive, Nora either perishes at the bottom of the Amazon, a victim of her own obsession, or decides to let go and live on after facing the ghosts of her past. Blood Orange seems to be an homage to classic cosmic horror and the battles with obsession and madness that the characters within face. Nora and Dr. C are both scientists chasing lost causes. There are no Razorback Dolphins, not really, and there is no Australopithecus in the Amazon. Despite the obvious impossibilities of their searches, they have both put too much into their search and are unwilling to give up. With Dr. C, it seems that his money and reputation were sunk into his obsession, and with Nora, it seems clear that in her mind, she lost Desiree to this obsession. If they come away with nothing, they've all thrown it away for nothing. It is my belief that this is the illness that befalls Dr. C. It isn't a true illness, and it's not quite a curse either, not really. Instead, it's his fall into delusion, and I'm sure while we're exploring a ruin filled with talking dolphins, he's battling his own demons back at base camp. Speaking of the dolphins though, let's examine these. Their names are all Portuguese, and translate relatively easily. Detestar's name roughly translates to hatred or to detest. Pesar's name means to regret, and Tamir's name roughly translates to fear or dread. The dolphins are, in my opinion, other cursed souls. Pissar in particular talks about the other dolphins and their purpose, and seems to imply that she's forgotten it to Tyne. Tamir talks about their existence as a curse, 
and that currently Nora's in the same situation as they are. Between this and their extremely human behavior, I believe that they are the remnants of the souls that have been lost to this place. In fact, in ending D, when you choose to stay, the dolphins crowd around you and a dolphin's eye twitches as yours roll up, implying a connection. I believe that in ending D, you join the dolphins as a trapped soul. In a game that is about letting go and moving on, I believe this marks it as the definitively bad ending. This brings me to the next interesting part of the game, the other three endings. The achievement descriptions and name of each ending are Remember to smile, parted on great terms. Remember me, parted on good terms. And always somewhere else, parted on bad terms. I believe that, despite using words like great, good, and bad, all of these endings are meant to be good in their own right. The game's central theme seems to be about letting go of the past, about moving on and leaving obsession behind before it consumes you. In that way, each of the endings shows a different way to go about this. Endings A and B are more positive, but they're not necessarily better than ending C. It's about moving on, however Nora needs to do it. The game's emphasis on photography is well used in these endings, and the two positive endings show Nora keeping photos of Desiree around to keep her memory and love alive while the more negative ending C uses them as a metaphor for pushing that part of her life behind her, even if it means leaving all the good behind with it. It's about setting up a new chapter of her life, and while C certainly is a downer, it's not a bad thing, it's not the obsession. Interestingly, on the two positive endings, Nora doesn't chide the player too much for choosing to leave her. In fact, she seems open to the idea, glad that you get to move on. I think the endings are dictated by how each version of Nora interprets the last moments of their relationship. For A, Nora is guilt-ridden and broken down, unable to think of a life without Desiree. So when she leaves, Desiree tells her to keep smiling, to live for herself. For ending B, Nora has been pushing the guilt away, suppressing the memory. And so Desiree only wishes for Nora to remember her, to remember the good times they had. For C, Nora has begun to resent Desiree for causing the guilt that she feels, and instead of trying to hold on to the good, she pushes every part of her away to focus on the future. Somewhat selfish, but still avoiding the fate of the dolphins. There's so much more to Blood Orange, and I wish the game was more well known and the community larger so that I could hear more people's perspective. For now, I'll just say that you should definitely check out the game on Steam and support the developers. I had a lot of fun playing the game, and I think that the game deserves to be way more talked about than it actually is. I've linked to the Steam page in the description below. Let me know what you thought of this video in the comments, and I'll see you guys next time. I know it's kind of an abrupt ending, but Really, there's not much more to talk about in the game. This is as much as I could come up with for it, and I really want other people to give some theory crafting. So if you've played the game, leave your own theories in the comments below. Correct me if you think I'm wrong or add on to what I've said. I'd love to hear it. All right, see you guys next time.